just use that and either um, um, Julian or I will uh, you know, give you the nod to, um, to ask your question. I'm not sure what you do when you're on an iPad. I'm uh, not, I never uh, use Zoom on an iPad, so uh, <laughs> I'm not too sure what it is. But uh, first, let me introduce Julian. Um, Julian's uh, research seeks to understand how self-esteemed agents, machines, humans, and other animals can learn to coordinate their actions without a central planner. He is particularly interested in social dilemmas and cooperation. Julian will discuss the problem of cooperation, how we can use computation to understand it and what the implications are for future technology, where artificial agents may need to cooperate with other agents and human subjects. I'm extremely interested in this because um, with technology and uh, in this household, we have lots of social dilemmas. So maybe during your talk, Julian, you'll solve some of my problems. So over to you, Let's Julian. Let's hope so, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and then uh, we can get started. Um, let's see. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yep. yep. Yes. Great. So um, welcome, everybody, and, and thank you, uh, particularly David, for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to have the chance to talk to you all. Um, just before we started, I was learning a little bit about the the club and uh, it sounds lovely. So very, very, very um, glad that I was invited. So, um, so I'm a computer scientist at Monash and I use computers to study cooperation and I study cooperation to design uh, future computing technology. Um, I think the format here is going to be a conversation. So the plan is um, I'll spend about 10 minutes or so uh, pitching an idea, uh, and then we can discuss it, ask questions, etc. And I want to start with um, kind of a very general and, and somehow provocative statement, which is that artificial intelligence uh, must be social. And so when I say this, um, what I mean is that artificial intelligence of, always has had as a model um, human intelligence, you know, from very foundational things uh, like the Turing test, we know that what we want is essentially um, to replicate the natural phenomenon of human intelligence. So what I would argue here is that a defining feature of natural intelligence is what I would call the social world. Our capacity to reap the benefits from cooperation opportunities to accomplish large exercises of coordination like this very club, um, and also to compete and juggle all of these aspects across different environments. So this idea is not mine, actually. Um, it's um, an idea that was proposed um, in 1998 by a biologist called uh, Robin Dunbar. And so it's called the social brain hypothesis. And what it argues is that what gave us intelligence, you know, human intelligence, is our, our social life. And so this is known as the, as the social brain hypothesis. And you can look at some evidence that shows that, you know, the kind of the, the size of the neocortex, that's the part of the brain that deals with high order thinking, uh, increases with the size of the social, of, of the average uh, social group that you have in, in, your, in your community or in your ecological life. So if we look at humans, um, then you know, the argument is that they can support a very rich social life because they have a large neocortex. And so therefore, um, what I argue is that because the ultimate goal of artificial intelligence is to, um, um, to replicate human intelligence, then we need to think about 
and intelligence that includes our social life. Now, um, to, to I, I don't think I can see hands up, so maybe um, maybe you you can just interrupt me if, if you have any questions. <laughs> um, now, and if, to, if, to, if I yep. may, <laughs> yep, that's very nice. Yep, but you're going to be talking to us about artificial intelligence. And uh, look, maybe I'm jumping in entirely too early here. Feel free to shoot me. <laughs> but um, it seems to be that you're operating from a given, that given being that artificial intelligence is desirable. Mm. If that is so, why is it so? Mm -hmm. I think that that's a very general question. Um, I do think that artificial intelligence can have the uh, capacity to improve, you know, everyone's lives. Um, whether that is the case, you know, in the particular economic and social arrangements that we have, I think that's a different question. I think there might be an argument to say that uh, that we need stronger regulation in certain aspects of this technology. Um, so I would, you know, I would be um, uh, you know, I would agree with that. Uh, but I also think that, you know, as, as a field of science, just like medicine, it has the capacity to improve everyone's life. Um, it is in that sense that I think it is desirable, but, you know, if the caveat is about, um, um, you know, potential bad outcomes of this, I, I am very well aware that they are possible and, you know, to that, what I would say is that we need strong regulation and understanding of, of the science behind it. But, yeah. Look, fair Hopefully enough, <laughs> but yeah. we seem as a society to be facing what I would posit is a rapid and perhaps exponential decline in natural intelligence. Please quote three <laughs> examples, three really simple, straightforward, concrete examples of, of, of what artificial intelligence can do to mm -hmm. better human existence. So my favorite example, uh, which actually uses a, a subfield of game theory and uses computation um, uh, is, is perhaps uh, kidney exchange. So if you think about um, people that are donating kidneys, you know, when these kind of operations and kind of surgeries started, we were basically restricted to what we call pairwise exchange. So, you know, I find the donor for a particular uh, recipient, and then if they are compatible, and that's a big if, I can go ahead and do that. So, um, this is not my field, but I know that what happens nowadays is that there are algorithms that use some AI techniques as well um, to come up with uh, way more complex change, chains of exchanges. So, you know, if you need a kidney, uh, I may find a donor. It's not necessarily um, going to be your kidney. But by looking at a big database, I can come up and engineer, if you like, a big chain of exchanges that will get you an organ. Now, to me, that is wonderful. And is, you know, one of these examples where I think, um, you know, that some of the techniques that come out of AI actually have a very positive um, impact in, in everyone's welfare, if you like. And I am happy myself, even though I, you know, to my knowledge, I don't need a kidney um, right now, as far as I know. I'm very happy that that technology is there because I, I know it has shown to increase um, the likelihood of, of finding donors and, and that is actually saving human lives. So that's one example. Um, yeah. Uh, Look, happy, happy to, happy to keep discussing that. But I, I think I'm gonna, in the interest of, um, 
kind of polishing my argument, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and continue here. Um, so let's go back a little bit. So um, what I argue is that the social life is important. And I guess the easiest way for us to understand why is to think about um, the concept of an artificial agent. But before doing that, I'm going to tell you about the you know, something that is a lot closer to, to all of us, which is the concept of a personal assistant. And so this is typically um, something like what we all have in our phones these days. So if you want, you can actually, you know, pull out your phone and in natural language, using your voice, um, ask, for example, what is the shortest route to get somewhere? Or you could ask, um, you know, the assistant to put an appointment in your calendar or to reserve some time in your calendar for a particular activity that you want to do. Now, we call these personal assistants because they actually respond to instructions. Um, but if you kind of take that um, uh, idea a little bit further, you end up with the concept of an agent. And so the idea of an agent is that it's a, it's again, it's a software, it's a, it's, it's a piece of software, but instead of responding to your instructions, it's executing actions, actions autonomous, autonomously responding to objectives. And so, you know, coming back to the example of the calendar, one thing is to tell the personal assistant, um, you know, I want to have a meeting tomorrow between nine and 10 with David, um, and you can invite him and, you know, sure that that is something that the assistant can do something a little bit more advanced is to actually um, have a piece of software that i don't need to give instructions to but that actually executes um you know actions autonomous autonomously on my behalf given my objectives so you know if we think about this uh, and the calendar uh, metaphor uh, rather than saying that I need some thinking time tomorrow between the um, hours of 8 and 10 a.m. I would rather tell the computer program or the computer program could perhaps learn about what is my most productive time for thinking and, and writing. And then autonomously find the spots to do that and negotiate my agenda on my behalf without me giving specific instructions. And so this idea of an agent is actually uh, um, very important in, in artificial intelligence today. Now, um, the next step is that, of course, you know, I, so let's suppose that I have my own agent that is making uh, decisions for me because, you know, it understands my objectives. Uh, but in a similar fashion, David can also, has an, can also have an agent. And that agent is going to be uh, perhaps doing things, um, um, you know, on uh, um, on his behalf, and potentially will have to negotiate with my own agent. And so, once you have more than one agent, um, then because each agent has its own agenda, this can lead to different scenarios where these agents may may find in a position where they have to cooperate, perhaps coordinate, or perhaps compete with each other. So, um, now this may sound like it's really far away, but I, I like to argue that it's actually already here in some ways. So if we think, if we think about the trading floor, um, you know, trading platforms, uh, have estimated that as much as 70% of the transactions going on are actually originating in, in algorithms. Now, I'm not arguing that all of these algorithms are agents, but the potential for agents to interact with each other, it's already there and it has been there for you know more than a decade. Um, so, the scenario that we find ourselves in is one scenario where potentially all of these agents are interacting with each other. Um, and what's important here is that then we, because every agent has its own agenda, we need to understand a little bit what the incentives of these agents are. 
And so what we call the problem of cooperation arises when individual incentives are not aligned with collective actions, or sorry, sorry, collective outcomes. So what does that mean? It means that what may be best for my agent to do, you know, if everyone in the system is following their own agenda, it may result in a situation that is worse for everybody. So we call this the problem of cooperation and we can explain it with a very simple um, example. Um, so here we have two agents that have the option of helping or not helping. Very simple example. And so the idea of helping is that I pay a cost to benefit someone else. Let's say that cost is one unit and the benefit is three units. It can be um, you know, money or it can be anything really, it's just a utility. Um, and if I don't help, I avoid the cost, but may still benefit from others. So what this gives me, it's a situation where, you know, if I help and you don't help me, then I pay minus one and you get a benefit of three. If we both help each other, then we both get a benefit of two because we're both getting the benefit, but also paying the cost or we can decide not to help, in which case we go home empty-handed. We put this, so the, the field that studies these interactions formally is called game theory. And when we put these numbers in a matrix like this, um, when we think about this from the perspective of either agent, it's always best not to help. So I can quick, quickly show you here, this looks more complicated than, than it is really. So if we think about this agent one, what's the best thing they can do when agent two chooses um, to help? So they can get two or they can get three if they don't help. So that means if agent two is picking this, my best bet is to go for this option. Now, what if agent two picks this option here, then again, Agent one is choosing between just paying the cost and not getting any benefit or going home empty handed. In this case, zero is actually better than minus one. So this makes sense for agent one. And if we think about the situation is completely symmetrical. So what we end up with here, let me just clean this, is everyone picking this outcome. Now that's terrible because even though everyone is following their own maximizing principle, everyone can be better off if they were here, but the individual incentives are not there for that to happen um, with this model. So this is known um, also as the prisoner's dilemma. And it's just one example of how um, agents that follow their own agenda end up in collective results that are not optimal. And so what we do really around this very simple idea is two things. We design artificial agents that can navigate this problem of cooperation. That means they are able to cooperate with others if the opportunity arises um, while also allowing themselves not to be exploited by others. And we also use computation, particularly computer simulations to understand cooperation in the wild. So an example of the first idea is just, that he's a very simple task where we're just testing uh, one algorithm. We have two agents um, and they are tasked with the, with, with the, the, the task is basically to go pick up a, a target um, resource and collect as much of it as they can. And so if you apply kind of standard AI algorithms in these agents, what you end up is with something that looks like this. So each agent is only thinking about their own benefit. They go up the slope, pick up the resource and bring it back. Now this is not, not a terrible outcome, but it's not the best outcome. 
because if these agents realize that there's an opportunity to cooperate here, what they, what they can learn is that by specializing, one of them stays at the top and uses the slope to roll down the resources, then they're actually able to um, collect more resources in the same amount of time. And so what's interesting here is that when you kind of design these algorithms uh, using um, examples from situations that are not social, you're, you're gonna end up with the, uh, with the example on the left, whereas actually a socially smart agent will identify and exploit cooperation opportunities um, in order to uh, benefit everybody. Now, the other thing that we do is we use computer simulations to, oper to understand cooperation in the wild. Um, so one example is you know, very close to home these days is understand compli understanding compliance with non-pharmaceutical interventions. So non-pharmaceutical intervention in a pandemic setting basically uh, are things that are not uh, pharmaceutical in nature, but that have an effect in mitigating um, um, epidemiological spread. So one example, wearing a mask, another example, um, um, doing voluntary testing. So the interesting thing here is that, remember that early example I gave you here, is very similar with, for example, wearing a mask, because what I do is I pay a personal cost because it's not nice to wear a mask. I personally, I don't enjoy it, but I do so because um, it provides a benefit to me, but also to others, including perhaps people that I don't know. And so what we know here is that the decision whether to wear or not a mask at the very fundamental level also has this structure of cooperation. And what we can do is we can simulate agents that are using this calculus um, and understand cooperation versus agents that don't. And we call that a behavioral model. So if you remember these epidemic curves from early in the pandemic, where they would tell us to flatten the curve. That's because traditionally an outbreak looks like this. You know, it, it grows, there's a peak and then it comes down. So what we find is that when we include this behavioral model on top of a standard model of epidemiological uh, spread, um, the predictions of the model are actually changing dramatically. And we are currently using these ideas, uh, working also with epidemiologists to understand more complex scenarios, um, particularly spread in childcare centers where the conditions of the network and the interactions are, are actually um, relatively easy to model because most of, the most of the people in childcare spend a lot of time together in a, in a single room for the whole day. And that's actually, it has some advantages computationally. So here's an example where we use this calculus of cooperation in order to understand a situation in the real world where those incentives are at play. And you know, it ends up with an algorithm that actually simulates and allows me to um, um, look at the trade-offs between different interventions and the effect that they may have on epidemiological outcomes. And I'm gonna stop there. I think I've already spoken for more than 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, happy to take questions now. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. So if anyone's got questions, it's like, uh, well, I see Viv, Viv Allison's got his hand. So uh, off you go, Viv. Hi, Julian. Sorry, it took a while to unmute. Um, just wondering um, what sort of um, interest you've taken in um, space exploration and the use of AI by NASA particularly, for example, trying to land a space vehicle on Mars where communications backwards and forwards using radio would be 20 minutes or so. So it's not really possible to remotely control the vehicle. It has to have its own decision-making um, facilities on board to be able to land the vehicle safely in a spot that's clear and so on. 
Um, have you taken much interest in this? And, and do you see this as being one of the huge um, uh, uh, possibilities for the use of AI? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, navigation, it's a problem, um, let's say from, from, from the planning perspective, I think is well understood. I have colleagues that, um, you know, they're called computational planners and they understand the nature of this problem. So I think from my perspective, I think it would be possible to, to have a robot that has some autonomy and that knows what the objective is, you know, perhaps reach out to a particular spot in an environment that is unknown and try to retrieve resources or take pictures or things of that nature. I think um, I, I would be fairly certain that the people at NASA are well aware of uh, the technology that is already existing and I think can accomplish those tasks. Um, I wouldn't say easily, but it's a problem that I think we understand very well. Um, where ideas like the, like the one I'm talking about could potentially uh, have an impact in that scenario is what if you had um, multiple robots exploring the planet at the same time? Then I like to distinguish two things. One option is that you have the multiple robots working for a single party. You know, let's say there's an international, um, you know, coalition of um, countries that have already solved whatever political problem they may have, and they all agree to explore jointly the resources in, in, the, in the planet far away. In that case, I think there's no problem for cooperation because the incentives are well aligned. What we are looking for as a group has no conflict with the individual agenda of the robots. However, I've said that this is only if we have solved the political problem. Suppose that there's a, a, a very similar situation where different countries are just sending their own robots and they haven't figured out um, the politics behind it. Therefore, each team of agents with, will have you know, um, their own interests. And I think here's where it can become problematic because um, then they're basically in competition and they may forego opportunities for cooperation that could potentially benefit them all. I would say that's, um, that's a part of AI that do social interactions that we don't understand as well as the standard planning problem uh, that would arise from having one single agent or one single team. But you know, that ho hopefully that uh, sheds a little bit of light on, on that. Yep, yep, thanks Julian, very interesting, thank you. Uh, I've got two questions. Um, what's the difference between an agent and a bot? And how do agents talk to each other to sort of do a deal? Excellent question. So um, when I think of a bot, I think typically, you know, and you tell me if this is the idea that you have in mind. So you have, uh, you know, I think there are bots in, in um, um, Twitter. kind of te <laughs> technical service, right? So I go to a web page, I have a problem, you know, whatever, I have a shipment that didn't arrive. I go to the website and it says, oh, yeah. chat, chat with us. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, then I think, oh, um, you know, and it turns out it's a bot. And I would argue um, we have done incredible advances in, in a subfield of AI that is called natural language processing. Mm -hmm. And so that subfield um, is interested uh, in the idea of understanding natural language. And so I think, you know, sometimes you can have a conversation, so to speak, with uh, with one of these bots um, for a long time. Um, I think um, you may even think that perhaps they're a human or perhaps, you know, if a human jumps in behind, you may not know when that happened. Uh, I think natural language processing is is quite advanced but it is different from an agent because the way it works underneath is um, it's, it's, it's typically based on kind of templates of conversations. And it looks at, you know, many, many um, 
data points of conversations that have been had in a similar context. And it basically polishes a model, which is typically a huge neural network in order to, um, um, to know how to respond to you. Now, I would say that that is not necessarily an autonomous interaction um, because I don't think the agent has a sense of um, an objective that needs to be achieved. It's just kind of simulating a template-like conversation for which we know what the answers are likely to be. And then, you know, if the agent every now and it, sorry, if the bot every now and then says, this this solve your problem, eventually it's just gonna send you to a human. Um, so I think that, that would be the difference. And how do agents negotiate with each other? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, for, I forgot the second the second part of the question. So typically, um, there are um, communication platforms, and those those may be direct, right? So if I have a team of agents that are doing something, um, you know, together, then they well may have protocols that allows them to exchange information. I think that's not different from um, you know the way different computers interact. Um, I think interesting cases where the communication is actually not direct. So if we think about agents that are trading in, in the stock exchange, uh, then you could even argue that, I mean, they may talk to each other, but for the most part, the signals that they're receiving are coming, are coming from the environment. Um, in terms of cooperation and communication, there's a lot of research on, on, on trying to come up with um, protocols and algorithms that allow these agents to kind of infer each other's incentives. But I think this is a very, you know, kind of early um, area of research in, in AI, you know, if, if, um, if we're thinking about social interactions between agents. Yeah. Thank you. Richard. Yeah, uh, about 30 years ago, there was a so-called artificial intelligence program that we used to run on a personal computer called M1. You, you program in the rules and then ask questions. And that, so it was a fairly simple and straightforward procedure. These days, what, what is the underlying programs used for artificial intelligence? Yeah, I think, I think that's a good question. I think um, I was talking just, just before um, we joined the discussion with everybody, I was talking to David about uh, artificial neural networks. And um, I think a lot of what we um, have nowadays, even in, even in working technology, like your phones and you know Siri or whatever assistant that they may be there, uh, there would be this neural network technology embedded in it. And that's quite different um, and, uh, you know, to, to a technology that actually works from rules and processing symbols, if you like. And so I think neural networks are great, but they are a black box uh, because all we're doing is kind of training connections, but there's no, other than the data that I am presenting, there's very little information about the task at hand. I think that's a radical difference from what we used to see that was kind of based on reasoning and logic and things like, like what you are describing. Um, there are some, there's some really famous people uh, these days that argue that neural networks can only take us so far and that actually the task at hand is to actually integrate that with symbolic processing. Um, of, of that is that is less that is less black boxy that that can probably you know push us further in the field. Uh, but I think that the, the the radical difference between the system that you're describing a lot a lot of the things that are successful these days is the things that are successful these days are very black boxy. So we know that they work fantastically, but we don't really understand very well why they work. And you could argue that there's, you know, in that very same thing, there's the limit of what these things can do. There's a counter argument to that that I think is interesting. And it's like, well, you know, we're trying to replicate human intelligence of, of, of sorts. So if we think about the brain, the brain is also a black box. And so being a black box in itself uh, is not necessarily um, 
something that will take us away from the goal, but I think that's something that we can debate and I don't think there's there's a clear answer to that. Can, can you name a specific neural network program that potentially could be down, downloaded and run? That can or, be what? That we could download that program and run it on our own computer and any sort of neural network program. Or are they too big for that? They... No, they're not. And they actually, you know, with the technology that we have today, you can actually run um, reasonably sophisticated things in your own machine. I don't have the link now, but I can try to do that after the talk and, and send it through uh, through one of the contacts. But, you know, if you think about um, character recognition, you know, that is I, I write something on a piece of paper and a machine takes a picture and then translate that to to letters in the alphabet, you know, or transcribes that if you like. I think that's a neural network that um, could could you could download and, and run even in your phone if you like. So, um, yeah. Can you name a specific neural network program? Not not at this moment. So I'll I'll look it up and, and send it uh, through but one of the they are there and available. Hopefully, yes, 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 absolutely. Hopefully free in the Linux world. David. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was going to make some comments, but I, I just changed my mind. And I, I'm going to instead ask you, uh, Julian, um, how this... I've, I've, now let me start again. I've seen quite a lot of work being done on swarm behavior and... and uh, having ants solve towers of Hanoi problems and mazes and all that sort of stuff is it's obviously not directly what you're talking about because you're talking about age independent agents which are simply which are goal seeking and hopefully pulling in a mutually beneficial di direction so how do how do those two kind of relate to each other Yes, I, I because think ultimately a, you'd have a swarm of drones that can drop little bombs on people, and they would <laughs> cooperate to wipe out the, the village in Afghanistan or whatever. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. I think when we think about swarms, um, we're kind of uh, again. I think a lot of the progress in artificial intelligence is based on some kind of some sort of natural analogy you know and you know so we've been talking about neural networks which are clearly the result of thinking about the organization of our own brains um uh and i think there's 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 a subfield if you like of artificial intelligence that these days i think they go by the name of collective intelligence and so the idea here is that you may have single units that are in itself not very smart, so to say, or very simple, but when they come together and interact with each other, then they have the capacity to actually do things that they wouldn't do on their own. Uh, I think you mentioned, David, uh, the example of, uh, I think, some ant optimization algorithms. And so there's, there's a bunch of algorithms, you know, you can think of an optimization problem as navigating a space where you try to find the, the highest peak. And so, you know, if you send a swarm of um, ants that communicate with each other through pheromone paths, then you can do simulations that actually show that they perform really well in finding peaks of, of whatever valley or, or whatever uh, topography you may have given by your optimization problem. Um, so I think um, what I would say the difference here is these, these swarms are by definition working together. So there's no conflict. If everyone is aligned, there's no conflict and, and that facilitates things. Whereas the problems that I discussed today, they're mostly arising from um, agents that may have that, that are not necessarily coming from the same entity. So therefore they may have different agendas and they may forego cooperation opportunities because they have been programmed to just follow their own reward seeking behavior. 
So that that I would say is the difference. Hopefully that that clarifies. I don't know if I addressed the question in full. Yeah, I, I think it does, and, and, and that also says to me that the the the, the swarm behaviour problem is going to be solved long before your um, corporation <laughs> altruistic corporation problem. I, I agree. I think, as I was saying, with the example of, of uh, you know, space exploration, if we send a team of robots and they all work for the same person, then that's a lot easier than finding, you know, a group of robots that are working for different parties. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Tom, sir. Yeah, well, uh, Julian, that, um, my question really follows on from David's. Um, you showed us a matrix with uh, two agents. Now, when you get to three agents, you start to get a situation where two of the agents could uh, get together and uh, create a situation where it's difficult for the third one. Um, <laughs> in, in fact, um, you're really leading to a situation where you, you've got corruption possi possibility. Um, how do you set rules for the agents to act? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So the example that I use um, was, you know, kind of decidedly a simple example. In... Sorry, Julie. Goldman, turn your mic off. I'm Goldman, your mic's on. Trying to mute him. Should I try again? Did I accidentally mute Julian? Yeah. Yes. Yes, you had. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll try again. Um, Put the host it, mute, John Goldman. I'm trying to click mute on him and it's not working. Oh, oh I, 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 I tried to, I, oh, I mute John and, it, and Julian winds up getting muted. You've virtually muted everybody except John <laughs> Goldman. <laughs> Who's our main host today? Could they just mute everyone and then Julian could unmute? Maybe. Let's you, see. you about <laughs> you. Well, I've got a mute. Well, okay, I'm going to mute all. Yeah. All current. Okay, I think I think we're good. <laughs> right, we're good. So this is a, this is actually a very good example because uh, <laughs> the larger <laughs> the larger the group, the typically the harder these coordination problems become. And as John was saying, you know, I was very cheeky and just for the sake of simplicity, offered a very simple two-player game as an example. But it is true once you have um, more than two players or more than two interested parties then the complexity of those problems increases. Okay. Um, the, I didn't very much talk about the example of the, of the non-pharmaceutical intervention. Uh, I didn't discuss it in, 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 a, in a lot of detail, but the framework that we use behind it is called the, the volunteer's dilemma. The volunteer's dilemma, it's a, it's a game between many players. And so the idea is that it has kind of a threshold structure where only when a certain number of individuals are cooperating, we see the benefits of that cooperation. So if you think about wearing a mask, you know, the more we do it, the, the higher the benefits that, that we see. So those kinds of games are, are multiplayer games and you're correct. They are harder to solve and, and the coordination exercises is also harder. I think a lot of the research these days at least in artificial intelligence, focuses on, on games between two players or pairwise interactions. But I think that's a good argument. I think, you know, as we've seen here, the larger the group, the harder it becomes. Thank you. 
Vince, did you have a question? Yeah. You're muted. Yep, yep, sorry. No, you're not. Um, yeah, Julian, are you aware of a, a robot that has been about two decades in the development um, by the name of Asimo, produced by the Honda Motor Company? I'm not aware of that one in particular. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, Asimo has been around for about 20 years now and um, started off barely being able to walk. But they've made incredible um, advances in terms of mobility. I mean, it, it can now run, it can hop around in a circle on one leg and all that sort of stuff, go up and down stairs. But um, the, I think the aim is to provide home help robots for elderly people. So there's an enormous world market for, for this sort of thing. And they've poured a lot of money into it. But the, the one area that I'm, in, that I'm interested in is it's okay to develop mobility and so on. That's one set of problems. But, but you're working in a field where there needs to be cooperation between ASIMO and the customer. You know, the elderly person that ASIMO is a partner for. Um, how far do you think we are off succeeding in this field? So I think, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, I have some of my colleagues who are interested in, in this very same problem, you know, of, of kind of, um, you know, helping, you know, aging people or vulnerable people. I think um, these, these are difficult problems. I think a, a lot of the challenge there uh, can be because these, these agents are actually embodied. So the, what I study, um, it's a lot simpler and, and you could say, you know, has a kind of a longer timeline for actually making into into a product because we're not even thinking about agents that are embodied. Once you have a body and, you know, parts that you need to control and, you know, the, the physical world, I think that opens a whole set of, of new problems. And I think some of those um, may, may very well be solvable. I, I recently saw uh, an example where, you know, physical robots that are basically opening drawers can learn from you seeing someone else performing the task. Right? So what happens is you provide the robot with hours and hours of footage of people opening drawers, and then they can actually figure out, you know, what pieces of the, half, of the hardware they have um, need to be um, you know, activate it or to open the drawer or, or whatever they, they want to do. I think um, if you think about interactions between um, a human and a robot that has been designed to help me, then in principle, um, I think those, 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 those robots have interests that are completely aligned with mine. So I, I, do, I have a hard time thinking about a situation where the robot would be competing with me. You yeah. know, you can, you can kind of take, um, so I think, you know, an example that I've, that I've seen discussed is, you know, maybe the robot, but I think this is really far. I don't think, honest, from my perspective, I don't think we're gonna see this in my lifetime, but some people argue, you know, you could find yourself in a situation where the robot um, needs to be turned off and the robot doesn't want that to happen, and therefore it starts to be in conflict with you. Uh, <laughs> I think that's an interesting problem. Um, I don't think we will be there very soon, but again, you know, uh, other people may have a different opinion. Yeah, I, I suspect that a lot of money is, is going into this because the market is so big, and people would probably pay a reasonable amount of money if they're an elderly person that wants to stay home, compared yeah. with the cost of aged care and so on, you can see the financials would certainly favour this sort of product. And yeah. it's you may be interested in having a look at Asimo. I, he may be named after Isaac Asimov, I think it's A-S-I-M-O. But yeah. um, the story of his development is really interesting because, I mean, for example, um, it can pour a glass of wine from a bottle to a glass. And when you think about it, um, 
there's an awful lot of technology in succeeding with something like that, but also handing the glass of wine to another person, which, which it does quite successfully. Just the sense of touch, it's got to be aware that the other person has actually taken the glass and it then can release. So Yeah, th those problems tend to be a lot more complex than they look, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. So the yeah, that's good. I've I've taken note of that here. I think uh, just because I mentioned the problem of uh, the robot that needs to be turned off but doesn't want to be turned off, uh, I've recently run run across that example um, in this book that is called Human Compatible by Stuart Russell, who's mm -hmm. a um, an AI researcher, and this book is is actually. Um, it's, it's accessible, so it's popular science. So you don't need to be in this field uh, in order to understand the ideas. And so I think if you're interested in, in that kind of uh, dilemma, uh, this is a really good book that I think it would be uh, very accessible. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think the, big, the big question is when will the three laws of uh, robotics be embedded in an Asimo uh, robot? <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, to me, I think that would be fairly easy to do. Um, you know, as Julian says, you, you're not in competition with the robot. The robot's there to help you. And surely it would be fairly easy to program it to always cooperate. Well, this, 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 this is sort of the, the, the problem that I, I think uh, Stephen was raising before about the the safety of robots, um, and and how do we regulate that? Uh, my view about about artificial intelligence in general is that we should regard it as a supplement to human intelligence, not as an alternative to to human intelligence. Um, when a man first picked up a lump of rock and started chipping on a piece of bone or something he was using tools and and uh, not always uh, for good good outcomes of course because he might have been chipping away at somebody else's skull but uh, we've always been tool makers and tool users and I, I think a, a properly conceived artificial intelligence is merely an extension of that idea I design things on for 3d printing and I use a computer to do it um, because there's no way I could generate all that stuff to control the printer, and I could certainly not make stuff by hand. So I don't think AI should necessarily be any different. It will need regulation. There's regulation on who can carry rocks around in town, probably, so they don't bash people on the head. But um, um, I, yeah. I don't really think AI needs to be a huge challenge for mankind. But once it gets into the hands of the military, I think that, that's where I can see some real dangers. Oh, yes, yes. And that's that's where we have the swarms of drones with little bombs on them and the whole thing, isn't it? Mm. Um, but that's where I, I would argue that's, 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 a, that's a political problem, though. Um, yeah. Not yeah. Necessarily an it doesn't mean that we shouldn't, you know, pay attention for it. I think obviously it's very important. And, uh, you know, I think at least in, in my institution, uh, we spend a lot of time educating future computer scientists um, about having, you know, a broad uh, perspective on all of these things. Because I, I agree that ultimately, um, if this technology falls in the wrong hands, you know, very bad things can happen. Um, so I think as a technologist, I think yeah, even though the problem I believe is political, I agree that you should be aware and, and understand it as well. Um, someone, I'm not sure whether it's a question or a comment in the chat, but um, uh, Lewis Clark said, can you make allowance for the unrehearsed event? I'm not sure whether that's a comment or a question. I, is, that, is that a question for me? I have no idea. This is the first time I've been to this event. So. <laughs> I'm not uh, sure. Not sure the context of that was. It was a while ago now. It's 20 minutes ago. So is Louis Cook the still there? Huh? 
Um, I guess if I could just try and interpret that question, I guess any form of artificial intelligence has to be able to respond to something that hasn't been previously rehearsed. It's got to have the intelligence to make judgments, for example. Um, driverless cars will have to make judgments, particularly in a situation where it has two choices and both might be equally as bad. So that, to me, that's an unrehearsed event. And I guess that's a real challenge, uh, I think, for AI. I, I, don't I, think think there, I don't know what you think, Julian. I think, I think there that the one big difference is that human beings at the moment, and uh, I mean, I've had several experiences of this in, in my lifetime, can actually rehearse events in their own brain. You can, you can, you can imagine something and visualize what you're going to do. A famous one for me is I was in, in um, Gothenburg one night and I decided to go out and do some night photography. And as I was walking out in this sort of harbour side district, I thought, well, what if somebody sits on me? What attacks me? I was carrying my camera on a big long tripod. And lo and behold, when I got up on the main street, somebody did have a go at me. And I had actually rehearsed that situation in my mind beforehand. And I used the tripod to defend myself from these two drunken kids who wanted to steal my expensive looking camera. So, but an AI can't do that. That as far but, as- But uh, finally, I, I, th I think, I think, I think this is debatable because I think there are some techniques that are, so I think it's I just thought replay. of the Go computer, yeah. Where, where they kind of uh, yeah. simulate things yeah. that are not necessarily interactions with the environment. So I think yeah. some people have worked on, on techniques that, that may yeah. be similar. The yeah. other example that we've mentioned, I think, is it's uh, self-driving cars. And I think that's another one where I think there's, there's very interesting, because I think those are problems that are very close to us. You know, I think the technology to some extent is there, but I think there are very interesting moral problems associated with that technology. Um, you know, so I, I have a colleague in Germany who studies the dilemmas that arise from these self-driving vehicles being utilitarian. Yep. And so for example, if, if I am, uh, you know, if, if um, should, should a self-driving vehicle make decisions in order to um, minimize the loss of life, even if it implies killing its own occupant. Um, and then would you, would you buy a car that you know is programmed to potentially kill you if it can save more lives on the other end, right? So I think um, those are really interesting questions that are also, I think, ultimately questions about regulation but that are very, very close to the technology that is being developed. And we need people thinking about it um, and, and trying to come up with solutions. Yep. yep. And, and yeah, I think that a lot of these things are going to come much faster than we think. Um, I mean, if you look at the sort of things that Elon Musk has achieved, which before he had done so, you would have thought wouldn't be possible. So I think where the motivation is there and where there's plenty of money available, I think we may see advances in this area much faster than we're expecting. You will notice too, Viv, that the, the, the excitement and hype around self-driving cars has tapered off quite a lot. I think that the whole industry has sort of taken a bit of a step back to it. Oh, hang on a second. Okay, that's all really cool, but... And, um, of course, a tiny bit of bad publicity goes a long, long way in that space as well just need one idiot to drive his car straight into a truck on the highway and, and it's on for young and old. Yeah. Um, but they're also, uh, Julie would probably be aware of it, the, with self-driving cars is actually now a sort of officially adopted uh, sequence of, I think, five different levels of autonomy or something like that. And currently we're at around, around about number two, I think. Um, so it's actually, it's still a long way to go once you really map out course for it yeah yeah so i think it's with two years or 20 years i don't know yeah with self-driving cars the way i see it uh it's going to be it won't be a case of suddenly there'll be a self-driving car on the market no they'll become increasingly self-driving it, it'll be a, a process of gradual um changeover from human being in control 
and that'll get less and less and less until maybe in 15 years time the cars will be completely autonomous yeah there's probably a few people in this meeting right now who've got cars that will slap the brakes on if you start driving straight up towards a wall or an obstacle my car doesn't because I didn't pay the extra two thousand dollars, but it, it gives me a warning. Say, hey, you're going too far, too fast. What's that car in front of you? Slow I'm, not go, Mike, I'm not going to try. I had a bird <laughs> fly in front of mine, and the brakes went on. Oh, really? Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Ashton, you've got a question. Ah, uh, yes. Um, could you tell us more about what you see with agent? But in the future with agent-based modeling and AI for education, for people trying to learn things. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's a new um, kind of reasonably new drive uh, from, from a certain group of scientists that are trying to use these, these learning techniques as a, as, a, as a way to model human behavior. And so I think uh, you know, interactions between humans are complex, but you can try to simulate some, some aspects of those in a computer. And I think um, it's, 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 re it's a relatively straightforward exercise if you think about it, but I think it has the potential to, to explain phenomena that, you know, would not necessarily be completely accessible. Um, I think this in itself is, is potentially... Um, applicable in an education setting where, you know, people are trying to understand the phenomenon. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of AI and education, there's, there's a large, large um, literature that studies, you know, problems that are related to education, right? So I have a colleague, uh, Dragan Gasevich, who's, who specializes in, in what they call learning analytics. And so that is basically software that learns from data that arises from um, um, uh, educational settings. And so, you know, uh, it could be, you know, so some people are thinking, for example, about um, tutors that are trying to, you know, uh, automatic tutors, if you like, that are trying to perhaps navigate a level of skill in order to <clears throat> maximize progress, if you like, and things of that nature, or, you know, analytics around, uh, you know, attention and, you know, engagement and how we can use algorithms to try and predict what will be more engaging or less engaging. And, you know, that may potentially have an impact in education as well. So I think, um, yeah, it's, there's, a, there's a big uh, component of AI that is particularly interested in that. Um, I think, you know, if you Google learning analytics, uh, then there'll be plenty of, of examples around that. Michelle, did, did, I, did, did I answer the question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I've heard that uh, like there's AI counselors, especially for war veterans, um, the, the artificial intelligence counselors um, can be more helpful to unload on than the human ones. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I think, I think, uh, I mean, I haven't heard about that particular example, but, you know, I'm not surprised. Um, um, I think it's interesting with some of these personal assistants, um, you know, be, be it the Amazon one or the Google one, I think sometimes they appeal to an emotional level. So, so, you know, yesterday I was listening to a podcast that was about uh, giving these assistants the voice of someone you know, and you know their ability to actually mimic someone's voice uh, oh, wow. from very little input, and and I think this is, uh, I personally find it a little bit problematic, you know. So so people immediately oh, really? give the example of, of uh, you know perhaps having uh, some of your deceased loved ones now be embodied in a machine that is talking to you all day. I mean that's. I think that's problematic uh, along a number of dimensions, but I think it also <laughs> shows that uh, that there's sometimes this kind of emotional appeal. Uh, you can make a lot of money out of that, I think. You could start a few churches, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, 
No one else? Uh, Eunice McLean, you had your hand up earlier. Did you wish to ask a question? No, sorry, that was an error. Uh, don't apologise. Uh, just ask your question if you had one. But are there any other questions? Of yes, Peter, could I, could I just ask Julian another question? Go ahead. Um, Julian, it occurs to me that insects like bees and ants must have a very high level of ability to cooperate um, in, a, in fairly simple ways, because I assume that they can't be as intelligent as humans based on their size, but that may be incorrect. But um, are they used as, uh, or is there any study as to how these mechanisms work in, in these sorts of social insect colonies? Do you learn much from them? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think a lot of um, a lot of what we can do in designing agents that can that can learn to cooperate takes inspiration in in cooperation that we see in the natural world. And I think in the natural world, I would argue there's two champions of cooperation. Um, number one is humans, because we can assemble in large groups and build cities and things like that. But the other example is, is uh, what is known as eusocial insects. So these insects, um, they have a particular social structure that allows them to cooperate uh, and you know, perform tasks at the group level that would be impossible to do uh, on their own. I think the theory of cooperation there uh, often uh, relies on, on um, um, you know, so there's a theory called inclusive fitness, uh, which relies on the genetic structure of these particular individuals and how uh, it is actually not about the individual, but about the gene. And so I think this, this view was championed by Richard Dawkins in a very famous book called The Selfish Gene. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and so I, I do agree that there's different kinds of explanations for cooperation in the real world. And we certainly take inspiration for those. And indeed, uh, social insects are, are, are a great example and, and a particular way in which cooperation can, can work in the natural world. Do, do we know whether or not um, that cooperation works because of some sort of hierarchical structure? I mean, is that a component in, in terms of um, cooperation? So the, the cooperation in, in your social insects, so is this idea, this idea that is inclusive fitness, is that um, the argument, it revolves around evolution, right? And so I think the, the, the simplest way to explain it is if you think about what I said, right? Cooperation is, is incurring a cost in order to help somebody else. And so if, if I were to take that view of inclusive fitness, what I would argue is, um, you know, I can jump of the bridge for two brothers or eight cousins. But if, <laughs> and that, you know, you kind of get an idea of how the calculus there works, but it is based on the idea that the individuals that I'm, that I'm saving from my altruistic act carry a portion of my genes. And therefore, I am not helping them as individuals, I'm, I'm helping my other genes that these people happen to carry copies of. Yep. Okay, thank you. D does that make sense? Yes, 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 it does. <laughs> it's fascinating too. <laughs> turn your mic on, Peter. I just turned my camera off and turned it on. I forgot that I had to turn the mic on. Uh, <laughs> So, any further questions of Julian? No? Well, thank you very much, Julian. Um, obviously, that's the way of the future. Uh, I have a, a, a couple of problems uh, that I can see in my life. Uh, my family say I live in a bubble and I just won't get out of it. Uh, I'm concerned that uh, my grandkids don't ask me anything my great grandkids don't ask me anything and I suspect it's all because of artificial intelligence. They think it knows more than great grandpa. 
and uh, I was looking forward to being the uh, old sage of the family, which it doesn't look I'm going to achieve. Uh, the other thing that concerned me, you talked about everyone having an agent. Uh, I'm concerned that um, there's disharmony in my household at time. What happens if both our agents are in disharmony? We're going to have four people all at each other. Two mum and dad and two agents. Uh, are we ever going to overcome that? Or am I um, worrying about something that will never exist? But... Uh, but anyway, that's that's a problem that uh, I may never have to worry about. But look, thank you very much. It's obviously the way of the future. It's it's all <laughs> beyond me. Uh, I'm capable of turning the computer on and playing solitaire, and I think I'm pretty good if I can do that. Um, you, I'm just not up with the modern world. Uh, I complain to everyone. I lost my job through a computer and I've hated them ever since. So uh, and, uh, AI is probably even worse, but thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Thank, thanks, Peter. <laughs> Th thanks everybody. Really. really yeah, thank you, Julian. Thanks, Julian. Now it's, uh, what do I say? 12 minutes past. So um, maybe 20 past, we'll get back together again and uh, hear from our esteemed president. I've tried to get in touch with uh, Rob Brown and I hope he's got uh, five or ten minutes of music that can entertain us while we all run off for a cup of coffee. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you're suitably uh, refreshed after that uh, slight break. Um, so over to you, David, for your uh, report on the goings-on. Finishing off my apple. Thanks, Peter. Well, I think that went rather well. Um, oh, already, already had exchanged thank you messages with, with Julian. I don't have a great deal to report, uh, but I'll mention a couple of things. Um, on Sunday, this is all about, uh, I saw in terms of, of inventing new things for the club to, to occupy itself with. On Sunday, um, Stephen Zulaga, Vice President, ran a session at uh, Morabin on uh, electronics and Arduinos and things like that. And he, he, I, let's say he and I have been have sort of been working to reconcile our different opinions about how some of those things should work. Uh, he, he sort of contacted me the other day, and it had actually worked out very, very well. And I'm I'm learning that young people the younger people they work in different ways their minds work differently um and you have to approach activities with them in a very different way i'm talking about sort of the 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 teens and 20s and 30s they 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 just think differently so so the the thing that stephen did uh was more a journey of mutual uh mutually exploring the field of electronics and, and that sort of stuff rather than old gits like me would tend to stand up in front with a whiteboard and a pen and, and lecture which apparently doesn't necessarily work very well with the young people so that's sort of just a bit of an observation i suppose stuart's been doing his for not so younger people quite reasonably successfully stuart would you say yeah so thumbs up there um, and getting some members involved. So any members who, who want to a bit of face-to-face -face help, am I right in saying, Stuart, front, front up on Wednesday, on Wednesday? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think I'm on. Yeah. Yeah, every, every Wednesday we're spending some time there, that is myself and Jeff Amor, and we're helping anybody that turns up at the door. Um, Ostensibly, we're aimed at the uh, Be Connected project, which is trying to help those people who are, uh, let's say, nervous or uh, not very competent at using their electronic devices, smartphones, um, uh, iPads, all those sorts of things, and computers and laptops. And they're able to bring their devices in and we can assist them with whatever their problems are. 
uh, or they can come in and use our own devices, the ones that we have set up in the uh, in the club rooms in Moorabbin. And we also have available to us, and in fact, everybody has available to them, a very good uh, swathe of resources put out by the uh, indirectly by the federal government. It's on the beconnected.esafety.gov.au site. And it's, it's hundreds of lessons about all sorts of things to do with computers, smartphones, um, and tablets. So if anybody's keen to have a look at that particular site, there's, there's possibly something there to interest everybody, uh, whether it be uh, learning about how to get onto Twitter uh, or learning about how to share photos or learning about how to use a mouse to get back to the basics. So there's, there's something there for everybody. Uh, and even I'm finding... A, I thought I was fairly experienced at using computers, but even I'm finding some lessons there that are quite useful. So I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, David. Yeah, thanks, Stuart, Stuart. Would, I was just going to say, Stuart, would you mind awfully, please? <laughs> it certainly sounds like something I can use. Uh, are you able to post a, a link to that in chat, please? Oh, I, I'm doing that now. Thank you very much. Um, what else have I got to? These days, I've, I've, I forget what I was going to say before I even, yeah, whatever. I can't even remember what I had for breakfast. I saw, I saw a thing today about this, this, uh, this thing on Facebook. Uh, a woman said I got up to go somewhere, forget, found myself in the pantry, couldn't for the life of me remember where or why I was in the pantry. Then I realised I was going to the toilet. And when I got to the toilet and was not nicely seated, sit, sit, sat down, I noticed there was no toilet paper there. That was a joke. Thanks, John. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Nicholas. Okay, anyone else? Fred? Oh, hey, we all, we've got the audience with us here. We've got the Danis and the Harry and whatever you say. That's good. There was something else on my mind. I was going to, oh yeah, one thing. One thing I, I want to mention. This is sort of um, not nice as such, but I. You will notice that I send out emails about meetings. And I send out emails about ASCCA events and stuff like that. And I hope that you get them and appreciate them. Uh, I received a response from one member the other day who was grumpy about receiving emails about um, ASCCA. Is it ASWCA uh, courses because he's still not retired and couldn't attend them and regards it as spam. Please, I really wish people wouldn't consider uh, messagings from their own club to be spam. Really seriously. And right now we don't have any way of, of, of um, unsubscribing from individual email uh, uh, blasts anyhow. So um, we are a club. I hope people can be a little more tolerant of that sort of thing. Um, I think that's about all. There's not that much. I'm off, off to Scandinavia in a few days' time, so I will not be here for the next meeting. Uh, I'll be sitting at a little cafe in France, maybe, called Le Deux Magot, whatever the <laughs> hell that is, uh, eating a croissant and drinking French coffee, whatever that's like. So thank you very much. And I'll see you for October's meeting. Well, if they've got the internet, you can still join in, can't you? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'll, I'll take, I'll take the, 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 the I'll, I'll also blame the time difference for that one. I probably would, will be up by that. In fact, I'll well, probably be, be sitting early, there early at this cafe. There. Pardon? It'll be early afternoon there. No, it's about eight hours different, so it'll be late morning. We usually, yeah, we talk to our friends in Sweden, or family in Sweden, sort of in the evening, around about dinner time. I'm actually going over there for a young, young lady's wedding in August, early August. It'll be lots of fun. 
especially if our bags don't get lost. Well, thanks for that, David, and okay. uh, enjoy your trip. And uh, um, we, we'll try and think of you if we can. So now um, we've got Harry Lewis, who's the uh, uh, gentleman from my help, to uh, answer your questions and uh, to uh, give us any tips that he may have. So over to you, Harry. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm just envious of the president visiting the ghost of Jean-Paul Sartre in Les Deux Magots. Okay, um, I will open to any questions people have got. I just want to make a few com well, a comment or two about the latest revolution in our move away from the Microsoft cloud services to the Google ones. And I hope everyone here is aware of this, that the, the last member focused service that we're going to close down is the OneDrive. And that is the cloud drive that came in the package. Most of these services, by the way, whether it's Apple or Microsoft or Google, uh, include with their email some kind of cloud drive. Apple, it's iCloud. Google, it's just these days being called Drive or My Drive when you've got it. Uh, with Microsoft, it's OneDrive. So some of our members made very substantial use of the OneDrive. Um, I would say most made not very substantial use or none at all. So the committee has decided that we will close down the OneDrive service on the 30th of September. And we sent out an email a few days ago and followed it up with an SMS message to the members who had, for whom we had mobile phone numbers. And make the point is that we can't tell always whether a member has dealt with their own OneDrive issue. It was easier with email, of course, because we could see they were using the new service. Uh, we, we can get some evidence, but we don't know. So it's very much up to members to look at what they're doing. We hope that most of the members using OneDrive have realized they are using it. And we've suggested in a document uh, that's been posted uh, into the discourse forum, uh, the alternatives that are there for the members to follow. And this is very much an individual matter. We are not prescribing what you need to do. Uh, if you value files in your OneDrive, then you need to take some action to move them to a new place. Your choice of the new place is up to you. It is constrained uh, in some ways because we get from Google a total of 30 gigabytes of storage. And Google, in its way, puts everything in that particular box. It puts your emails in the box and it puts any photos in your Google Photos for that account in the box. And then it puts the files in the box. And if you even look, uh, I think it's, no, I have to check this. There's a nice graphic you can see very easily in Google that tells you what you're doing uh, with different colors for the different uses. So a small number of members, when I last looked, it was apparently about 40, would certainly need to use other storage for everything that was in the OneDrive if they wanted to keep it. Most of the members using OneDrive would be able to fit what was in their OneDrive into their Google Drive if that's what they wanted to do with it. But this is where members are all different. Some members have paid Microsoft for the personal Microsoft 365 suite of programs, which is good old Office under a new name, uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. And if you're paying Microsoft on the subscription basis, you get a one terabyte OneDrive, which is exactly the same size as the ones you've had, one you've had from 
Mel PC in our Office 365 system. Some members have used the Apple system and they can go up from the default five gigabytes to 50 for a quite modest fee of just under $2 a month, I think. Some members may already be using Dropbox for their cloud storage. Dropbox tend to be, tends to be one of, the, one of the more expensive. We can talk about this if anyone's interested, but when I looked into this and I published a bit in Yammer and so on about this, this is a curious little market, the market for cloud drives. The, 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 bit, the, the great big leviathans of, of, of the scene, Apple, Microsoft and Google, give away a certain amount of storage when you have an email account. I think Microsoft's got back down to five now. I think it used to be more. Google, it's certainly 15 for a personal Gmail account. And I'm pretty sure Apple is only five. And they give that away free. One might say knowing full well that people are likely to run out of space if they do very much with it. But then when you look at what people are charging for the extra steps, it seems to me to be all over the place. So it's worth looking around. Dropbox happens to be pretty expensive and I'm puzzled what their market is. Because uh, as you probably know, if you've been near it, it's basic free allowance is only two gigabytes. So anyway, whatever. The only other thing I'll mention before pausing for any questions anyone may have is that the normal way to deal with moving old files from your OneDrive to something else is to use the OneDrive client tool or program, which is bundled with the, the recent versions of Windows. Microsoft has actually been trying to make us save our files to OneDrive in the cloud rather than uh, to documents on your computer. And the little program, it used to be two programs and now it's just one that you can tell to connect to more than one service. The only one personal, in principle, you could connect it to more than one company one, but very few Melbourne PC members are in that situation. So what you can do is you can have on your desktop a folder for your Mel PC OneDrive and another folder for your personal OneDrive, if that's what you've got. And you can just drag and drop whole folders from one to the other to copy them or, or move them, depending whether you've got your finger on the control key or not. And the same goes for the Google Drive with a, with a kind of twist. <laughs> not so long ago, Google changed their way of doing this, if you please. I think it's within the last year. So Google used to do the same thing as Microsoft and Apple still do. Namely, they give you a folder in your file explorer or your finder if you're an Apple user. And that folder is synchronized with the cloud drive. To keep it simple. So you have a copy of everything in the cloud drive sitting on your desktop. And by moving files to and from it, you affect what's stored in the cloud. The way Google's done it is a model a little bit like the way IMAP used to be supposed to work for email. You get a virtual drive. You don't get a folder, you get a virtual drive and Windows gives it a new drive letter. You can drag and drop into it that sends it up to the cloud. But what Google has done, interestingly, is to make your client, not, it doesn't have to hold copies of everything. It's more like the way an, an email program might show you only the headers of your messages and you'd have to pull the message down to read it. It's pretty easy to set up, but it's a slightly different system. We've documented it for you, but 
in practice, what you do on your desktop is just the same. So that said, I will pause gratefully and invite anyone who's got any issues or questions about this particular change uh, to, to raise them now. Thank you. Fred Lancaster's got a question. Yes, I've uh, just changed over from uh, uh, OneDrive and uh, I dropped them all into um, Google Drive and I thought, yeah. oh, that'd be nice. I'll, um, um, everything will come down and yes, everything seemed to come down. But when I started to uh, try to look at the files again that I needed, uh, they decided that they wanted to do the drive, uh, sorry, the uh, um, Google um, flight of stuff, you know, like uh, the word would go into um, uh, the equivalent of, of Google. And uh, of course, the different formatting um, was sending everything uh, skew with. So, is there oh, any... no, look, Fred, look, I, yeah. from what you're saying, yep. I think you were dealing with your Google Drive in a browser. Yep. Oh, now, yep. So uh, I, I see Richard's hand as well, but can I very briefly explain that? I should have really have mentioned it. Um, so, right. In the good old days, if you had a cloud drive, basically it just lived in a browser and you didn't have anything on your desktop. We're going back a long way. Mm -hmm. Then they introduced the desktop clients, which would synchronize with the cloud. But there is a big difference, absolutely. And this goes for Apple, by the way, as well as Google, because if you're looking at your cloud drive through a browser, you are, as it were, looking directly at the drive and not at a copy of it. But the toolbox you have to edit things depends which of the three services you're using. So Microsoft, we've got online versions of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and so on, which you use only when you've got a Microsoft account, by the way. Now, if you, if you put, an, let's say, a Word file into your Google Drive, you can't edit it as a Word file from a browser, okay? Mm -hmm. Because Google, there's obviously licensing issues. Google doesn't own Word, it owns Google Docs. So it will convert it to a Google Doc for you to edit it. You can then export it. And Apple's been there, I think for at least as long with its own desktop, its own office suite. So you'd, in Apple, you'd have to convert it to pages and then back. There is a, a small difference from the way Apple has set things up from the way that Google has. So, but if you're dealing with it on your desktop and you've got your own copy of Word on your desktop, which means now you've paid your, your king shilling to Microsoft for the privilege, right? Yeah. As you would have had to, of course, even before with us, you have to pay something. Yeah. Then you can edit it as a Word document. So once you get, get your head around that, I don't think it's too complicated. Um, we have, in, in our help, we've actually moved, the, uh, I'm actually looking at it on my other screen now, we've moved our main record of uh, cases, jobs we help members from what was an Excel online spreadsheet to a Google Sheet online spreadsheet because we have to be sharing it. So it has to be in the cloud, basically. You can't put it on it. Well, you can't nearly as easily share something that's sitting, say, on my desktop. So it goes into the cloud and we all access it from there. So basically, because we're giving up on the Microsoft system, we have to put it in Google Sheets. And that's what we've done. But you can, as long as you install, and I think, my, Google will lead you by the hand through it, by the way. If you go into your Google Drive, it'll give you the option to set, it, set up the client thing, even though the design is different, the idea is the same, but you just go through a little procedure. It'll set up the virtual drive 
And if I, I mean, I, I can click mine at the moment and tell you what my drive letters are because I've got both of mine on my desktop now. That's to say, I've got my personal Google and my Mel PC Google on my desktop. So I can open a file that's a, <clears throat> a Microsoft type file using my own copy of the Microsoft suite. So I'm glad you raised that, Fred. Excellent, thank you. Oh, thank you. Is it Richard now? I can see a hand. Yes. Um, now I've got a question relating to OneDrive and I was helping a friend today set up uh, her new machine with Windows 11. Yes. So I was going to transfer uh, files from another machine. Yeah. The uh, uh, documents and pictures. Yeah. Uh, on the Windows 11 machine, there was a documents folder. Yes. But pictures wasn't there as a folder except under OneDrive. There was no, there was no direct pictures folder unless you went to OneDrive. Yeah. So I'm wondering what a, what a Microsoft doing with their defaults. Uh, this is in line. I think again that, that I'm so glad you asked that question for, for a kind of similar reason. I don't know. I don't know. Others here will know better than I do exactly when they started this one, Richard. Not before Windows 8, right? I'm not sure it didn't start even then. Before then, the default place you saved a Word document would be in the, fo the folder called Documents, which of course was local. Right. And I don't. I, I can't remember what the hierarchy is, but for, if 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 you didn't tell Windows where to put it. Anything it recognized as a picture or a photograph would go into the local pictures folder. Now, what, what they changed, certainly by Windows 10, and I think for at least two or three years now, was that the default place things got saved was in the OneDrive. And that's of a piece with the fact that they wanted you to have an, a, a Microsoft account to run Windows. You know, you can go back 15 years and you could be running Windows and be nowhere near a Microsoft account. You might have all kinds of other email accounts, but you wouldn't have a Microsoft account. But Microsoft has joined Apple in that sense, hasn't it? Because Apple insists on you having an Apple account to run an Apple computer, let alone a phone. The phones have been there already, of course. You've got to have an account. With whether it's Apple or Google, uh, to, to run, the, run your phone. So that's happened to Windows. So Microsoft have it, like us to log in to Windows using the password to a Microsoft account. But in, as part of that orientation, they're also making the default saving place their cloud drive. Now, I suspect what's gone on there, I haven't seen this. I mean, I, I was trying to get my Windows 11 machine to warm up here and it hasn't, hasn't joined me yet. Just let me see if I can get it, get it to warm up because it's not something I've looked at. Whether it's a sub subfolder of documents, sorry, subfolder in, I don't know what the folder is in OneDrive, I'll have a look at it. That's what they've done as the default. You can create a big file locally if you want to, folder. They seem to have the library uh, libraries as documents and pictures, but it's a case of where that library is pointing to physically. Right. And, and you so, can, can't I'm saying certainly with the pictures, it was to uh, OneDrive pictures that, whereas there was a local documents folder. I am getting it's caught not, out by that. Not sure whether the yeah. library documents is pointing to that local documents folder no. or somewhere else. You no. end up uh, with files in places we didn't expect them to be. Exactly, yes. No, this has given us all a new headache we never used to have, right? Um, if I now, I'm just looking at pictures in my Windows 11, which is under this PC, but of course it, that's fictional because it's above the Windows seat. i just see if it'll show me where it is. I want properties, don't I? Yes. Um, no, it's local. 
when I'm, I mean, I, I find <laughs> file explorers' locations, the listings extremely confusing, Richard, right? Yeah, well, in, in uh, File Explorer, it, it shows both the library yeah. entries as well as the physical folder entries. And they may not, well, yeah, like they well, may not well, be the same yeah. thing. The last thing you see is the correct hierarchical position of anything, isn't it? Mm. What you're getting is actually pointers. And, and because they're all pointers, you've no idea what the logic, what, what the tree relationship is between one line and the next. No. No, I think yeah, yeah, that's, that's, what that's the point I'm making. So I have to go look or have to use one, a third party like um, tree, size free, tree Size Free. There's another one I've been starting to use that Malcolm Miles recommended where you actually see the tree structure mm -hmm. displayed in, in, a, in a graphically helpful way, right? But, but they're all playing this game. I mean, well, yeah, well, it, it used to be it used to be under uh, yeah. user account yeah. name, yeah. and then the then then the folder would be there, but it's not anymore. That's right. No, and Apple's just as bad as you probably know. Probably worse. Google, in a sense, isn't in this game. Though I must say, I haven't looked um, carefully at the structure of its file tree because I don't make much use of the the file dimension of, of Google myself. But I think one of the problems with Google is uh, I seem to remember. If you put pictures in their Google Drive, they, they uh, say they can use them. They, they, you don't have exclusive right to those pictures if you use them. Oh, yes, drive. that's right. And I think so that's you... a, I don't know whether Microsoft are going that way as well. Uh, if we put something into a Microsoft OneDrive, are they going to claim use of those pictures? It's a condition of Google's use. That uh, yeah, they've certainly. got open slather and use your pictures for anything, anything yeah. they want. I think, which is one of, one of the reasons why you want to avoid putting stuff in there. There's a question I'd like to raise, and I'm not sure Hugh is with us tonight. There is a bit of a Chinese wall between the the personal Google world and the business Google world, Richard. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying it's impermeable, but for reasons that seem to me to be obvious. Uh, if, 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 if you sell that service to a company, you can't go using company for third party usage, right? Mm -hmm. Because that would breach company privacy. So to compete with Microsoft, they can't afford to show stuff that's in our G Suite drives to third parties. Although we're kind of only minnows in the Google system, you know, the big boys are universities and big businesses and they're head to head with Microsoft there. So I believe, I think it's possible that, if, that if Philip Lynch is here, he might, I think you have seen him, you might know better. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that a foot will have a form of privacy, ironically, for the things that Mel PC owns, Richard, because th that's the pact with the devil we've made all along, though we don't talk about it very much. That, that what we're given free by Microsoft and then by Google is designed for large organizations that are gonna pay big money to, these, to Google or Microsoft. But for their big money, they get to control everything in, in their system, right? Now, we are, as it were, piggybacking on that and treating it as a private per person system. We don't go snooping at things and so on. But the administrators of these systems, and you see this coming up, members are sometimes puzzled by this. If, if you look, and again, I won't take up your time just to get the right thing on my screen. Members are sometimes saying, what does this mean? This is controlled by your administrator. There's, a, there's something that comes up on your Google, in your Google. And all that's telling you is what's been true all along with Microsoft and Office 365 that we are inside this, as it were, container of data that in, is assigned by Microsoft or by Google to Melbourne PC user group, as it might be assigned to the University of Monash or Melbourne University, or on one, one's, Melbourne is at Microsoft and Monash is Google. So they, they, in the relevant sense, own all the data in their systems 
but Google isn't about to, to, to give it to other people because that would immediately destroy their place in the market. I'm being very vulgar about this, if you like. <laughs> so I'm not wholly confident. Well, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that our photographs are safer in our Melbourne PC photos than they are in my personal Google accounts photos. But John may know better, John Thompson, but I'm gonna put that on the table as something that you can falsify if I'm well, wrong. Well, it sounds that if we wanna keep them local under our own control, we've got to use Linux. Got to use what? <laughs> Linux. Okay, I'm not, yeah, okay, fine. Let's go there, right. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Oh, Stephen, sorry, now, yes, yeah, sorry. Stephen, is it? I think you might- Sorry, happy oh, again. Okay. So Harry, it helps if I unmute myself, doesn't it? Look, th thanks to, to everyone who's, who's joined in this discussion, uh, because as very much a novice, I found it extremely educational. You've, <coughs> pardon me, you've, given me some good news in that I'm a, a, a Microsoft 365 sub subscriber, so I can go that way. Yeah. So that's beaut. Uh, at, at least that's one thing taken care of. <laughs> I'll be looking at the recording of this bit with great interest and, and trying to nut out the rest of it. Um, but going slightly away from the, the um, mechanics of, of things, um, as a, well, to quote a concrete example, as an RSL member, the RSL sends out everything using Dropbox. Now, I've never understood that. Could, could you please, or could someone explain to me the rationale of that? Because otherwise, I mean, it would be the case that you get, to, you know, virtually everyone sends you an email and, you know, there's a document there that's a PDF or it's a Word file or something like that. Everyone's got that. What's the rationale? What's the thinking behind using a, a service like Dropbox? Well, I'm not up to date. Dropbox is has managed to remain a leading provider of cloud storage. And it was in the game very early. And I'm very surprised it survived in the way that it has, but it's a very rich company. So it's doing something right. One thing it's doing that isn't right for the likes of you and me is char charging very large sums of money for significant amounts of storage, anything above its two terabytes, so, subject to its own rules. But I, I don't think I fully understand. You can use Dropbox. And there are a number of services that work this way to distribute files and what, what they and, and I hope somebody else will come in and explain in more correctly exactly how, what Dropbox is up to. But uh, you've got one thing you, whether it's Google or Microsoft or Apple, you can link to a file. The, the preferred way of sending a large file these days by email is not to send it as an attachment, but to send a link in the email. Oh, okay, right? gotcha, gotcha. And that link, we can all play this with any of the cloud drives, whether it's Dropbox or Google Drive or OneDrive. You can ask it to create a link and you can give rules. You can say anyone's got the link can see the file or uh -huh. only the following X, Y, and Z can do it. And yes, maybe this is what, what's going on with Dropbox. I just haven't done it with Dropbox myself. Um, but if, if, for example, I go inside our Google system and ask to share a file, which is now obviously a file in a Google Drive and it's a spreadsheet or something. I get the offer to send the link to a list of names. In other words, Google will send an email. Now, I imagine that's what Dropbox is doing, but I'm a bit puzzled how it's doing it. Because okay. if I'm talking to Google or, or Microsoft or Apple, they are mail providers. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that Google was a mail provider. But maybe it's, it's using, I mean, you can't, Google doesn't, sorry, 
Dropbox doesn't host email in the way that Google and Apple and Microsoft all do, as far as I know. Doesn't mean it can't do the same trick by having the relevant servers in place specifically for its file transfers. There are file transfer programs that effectively work that way, but they never they don't sell email right as a service. But perhaps somebody else can come in and, and relieve my ignorance about how Dropbox is doing it. Because it sounds as if you've got quite a big mailing list there, Stephen. In the RSL. Well, uh, it, the RSL would have, yes. No, no, that, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, it will have a... But as far as you know, these are all coming from Dropbox. Is that right? What they do is exactly what you just said, Harry, which is they'll send you an email and they'll say, click this link to, you know, to read all the documents associated with it. Yeah, okay. All and, right. I um, and I'm interested in your saying that Dropbox charges high fees for what it does. That's, yeah. that's the RSL all over getting the worst deal. Um, but yeah, okay. So it's a file sharing system and they've elected it as, as, as the one that they're going to, to use. Fair enough, okay. Thanks very much. Okay, I mean, it may be from what you said and I'm only too happy to defer to people who know more that Dropbox is only being used as the store for the documents. And the email is a different service is being used to send you those links. Okay, I mean, nothing, nothing wrong with that. F fine, thanks. But yes, I, th I think the, the common thread here is that as cloud file storage has become so standard, and we were looking at that with what Microsoft's done with its OneDrive, you see, there's been a move away from, uh, it's obviously much more satisfactory uh, for a document to, to exist in one copy on a server that can then be fetched at demand by different people. So compared with the, the load on the total internet, if significantly long documents are all being sent by email to thousands of people, it's a quite, it's a much economical thing. If you do it on demand, and then also the, the data costs are being distributed in a quite a much healthier way. So I think that's where we are. And of course, we, we, we did it in a small way, you see, when we sent out that message to you all about OneDrive. Um, we drafted the document, trying to set out what the alternatives were and so on. And there's just one copy of that, as it happens in our discourse forum. And you can, you can effectively, well, you can read it online. Um, actually, it's online only. You can't download it, I don't think. But um, whichever model you use, <laughs> We're, we're, we're tripping over into a quite different aspect of the way data is managed, aren't we? When, when you get a, an attachment in your Gmail, you can read it online without having a copy on your computer. You say, I want to read that, and it'll open in a new, a new browser tab, and you can, the browser's providing you with, 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 with the, um, the reader. Oh, okay. Or you can download it, or you can choose to copy it to your OneDrive, which means it doesn't come to, into your computer, but it goes into your OneDrive. So, so your head tends to spin with all these alternatives. And this is what Richard Bradford was saying, the low, you've got a new challenge to understand where these wretched files actually are. Yes. The, the where is an abstraction, of course, in the, at the end of the day, if you're reading them, there's something on your computer you're reading. But you need to have a sense of which storage it lives in, especially, look, especially because, I'm thinking more about the phones now, you need still to be pretty aware what data is actually stored in that little box and what you're reading when you're streaming, for example. Because if, say, you're using a streaming service that depends on the internet connection, you walk into the garden, away from your router, you suddenly lost half the music you were listening to, you know. I happen to have a, I have a subscription to one of the music streaming services that lets me download files so that when I'm out, or with, even with podcasts, I used to do this with, with podcasts, I can be walking anywhere and still listening to a podcast. 
but you, you have to be alert to where that file actually is, whether you're depending on it streaming down yes. to the cloud or whether you've actually comfortably got your own copy so that you don't need to be online or in your aeroplane or wherever you are in order to listen to it. Thanks very much indeed, Harry. Can I just make a comment about the RSL example? Yeah. Uh, the RSL only needs to transfer that file once and it's only stored once where there's just as much internet traffic by the receivers because everyone's got to individually download that amount of data. So it's yeah. on the receiving side, there's just as much uh, yeah. internet traffic. It's on the sending side from the RSL that they've got much reduced yes. sending. And, yeah. and of course, the cloud place, they, they've only got the storage in one place. They don't have to have a separate copy of that file stored for everyone's individual mail server gotcha. so dramatically reduces the amount of storage used yeah no that's very thanks clear. very much Richard. that's very clear thank you if i, I, if I could I all sorry if i could also add a, a quick comment uh, the rsl only needs uh, to use two gigabytes and it's all free if they use more than that they might have to pay so it may not be a, uh, a financial crippling uh, exercise. Right. I would imagine that uh, there's a possibility Dropbox would get a lot of kickback from the uh, internet service providers because of all the extra traffic they would get as people looked up the uh, emails on the internet all the time and taking time to read them on on browsers, etc. <laughs> okay. I think I suspect look, a lot of a lot of branches in the rabbit hole and opening up, aren't there? But um, what I'm thinking, John, is that that demand is random. Okay. If you think about it, the the classic spammer is sending a thousand messages in five minutes, and that is what tends to overload the system. It's like a denial of service thing, isn't it? If you have huge demands in a very small space of time, that's the peak demand that really strains these systems. But if you all get the email, they're opened at random times, and then you pull the thing down from Dropbox at random times. So it spreads that load. Whereas it, and, and by the way, MailChimp works this way. If anyone's used MailChimp, you probably plenty of people here have. You don't send attachments with MailChimp, you send links. Yep. So they're, they're in the same game of spreading that load. Very true. Very true. I'm actually looking at Dropbox. Uh, I, I want to know. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do the monthly charges. Their, their lowest for individuals is called PLUS, which is $18.69 a month Australian for two terabytes. So there's nothing below two terabytes with Dropbox. You go, you go from two gigabytes to two terabytes in one huge leap. Now, I think if you look at Apple pricing, let's say I think you get free five gigabytes, which is more than you get from Dropbox, but it's, almost not comparable because of all the other stuff that's in the package, right? But for under, I think it's just under $2 a month, you get 50 gigabytes, which is quite sensible for individuals. So this is why I'm quite puzzled about Dropbox's business model, right? And I suspect that their market here is organizations with bigger budgets than you and I have got, or just possibly individuals who are holding large volumes of data to be shared, but in more often in a commercial context. In, in their own ways, Google has some quite respectable charging. Unfortunately, they've withdrawn. They did have a facility where we in Mel PC could pay a bit extra, pay directly to Google to get I think in one case, a member has actually purchased one terabyte, but for their naughty people have closed that one down. But if you've got a personal Gmail account and you look at the pricing there, it's nothing like as punitive as, as uh, 
as uh, Dropboxes. And many, many members do have personal Gmail accounts. But you start where you are. Um, as, as, uh, as John mentioned, I mean, if, if, you, if you happen already to have invested in a Microsoft 365, it's very good value for storage. You're getting other things in the package, of course, but actually even the storage pricing there is quite modest compared with some of the others. I'm expecting, I think it would be very hard for us to get hard, good data on this, that many of our members, one way or another, will already have the storage they want. I think a four terabyte drive from Officeworks is very good value for money. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah, and fair play. No, no, that, that's a serious contender. We did, we did put this in the memo. In the, we, we put it in the memo, John, <laughs> a USB drive. No, when you look at those prices, you need a very good reason to go for the cloud, I think. You've got to yes. stop and think whether you actually need to be in the cloud. Yeah, agreed. So how are we doing? Any other issues? Just about to say, Harry, it's uh, ten past nine. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm very sorry. We've run fine. over. If there's no more formal questions, we might close the meeting. Uh, presumably, you might hang around for a while, and um, and others might want to have a chat. But we'll formally close the meeting, and I'll say good night to everyone, and we'll see you all in uh, September. <laughs>